I am New York. Yes, I'm New York. I am New York. Yo soy Nueva York. Solo New York. Just me New York. We are New York. Welcome to Diverse City, where we explore New York's eclectic enclaves one neighborhood at a time. I'm Zyphus LeBron. This month we're in West Farms, a residential community of just over 20,000 people in the South Bronx. Long ago, the area was part of Westchester. That was back in the day when it was called 10 Farms because there were only 10 farms on the land. Today, the area is nearly two-thirds Latino and 23% Black. It's got a median income of about $23,000 compared to 38,000 borough-wide and 61,000 citywide. Despite its reputation for being one of the poorest areas in the country's poorest congressional district, West Farms has a proud history. That heritage includes the fact that it was the second town to be founded in the Bronx. More recently, the neighborhood streets became a proving ground for a few hip-hop legends. On this episode, Future Farms, Urban Farming and how the practice is being touted as a tool to address food insecurities in the city. From doo-wop to hip-hop, why the area might be losing some of its musical history. And the Forgotten Fair, the story of an event that was touted as a spectacle to celebrate the Bronx, but became a debacle. Those stories and more coming up on Diverse City. Community gardens have become a big part of the conversation about addressing the city's growing problem of food insecurity. Put simply, food insecurity means that people don't know where their next meal is coming from. It also refers to the fact that there aren't enough well-stocked and affordable supermarkets within commuting distance in some communities. The city's largest food rescue organization, City Harvest, estimates that nearly one and a half million New Yorkers are struggling to feed their families. But there's a movement afoot that could change all of that. The gardens once used as a means of beautifying blighted neighborhoods are now being seen as bulwarks against poor health and a means of financially empowering poorer communities. As I found out, some of that impetus began here in West Farms. Being fire homes down. Karen Washington has been called the grand dame of the urban agriculture movement. The gardener of more than 30 years is also known for coining the phrase food apartheid. Washington says it was in an effort to draw attention to the fact that people of color in poorer communities were having a hard time accessing fresh fruits and vegetables compared to white people in wealthier neighborhoods. So there was a two-tier food system that we needed to talk about how that came about the history around food, how that came about. And I figured that by using the term food apartheid, it would start having those hard conversations that we needed to have. Many of those conversations about food justice started in West Farms, where back in 2012, the health department launched a program called Shop Healthy NYC. It was an attempt to address the findings of a study that showed that 95% of people surveyed bought their food at bodegas that were within walking distance and not supermarkets. The survey also found that 4 out of 10 people said they could not find healthy fruits and vegetables near their homes. Washington lived in the neighborhood for 37 years. Though she recently moved to Atlanta, she's continued to champion urban agriculture as more than just a means of feeding one's family healthy food. No one comes into our community to talk about wealth building. They don't talk about using urban agriculture as a way of thinking about entrepreneurship, ownership, um, credit, credit repair, investment. And so a lot of us took it upon ourselves to start thinking about what does entrepreneurship look like? Washington is an entrepreneur herself. She is the co-owner of a farm in upstate New York called Rise and Root. Her local roots, though, run deep, 
Through her legacy, that remains in the form of many of the urban farms that now exist. Those include the Garden of Happiness that she helped build in nearby East Tremont and the River Garden in West Farms. Both of those plots are owned by the city and fall under the Parks Department's Green Thumb Initiative. The program helps promote urban farming. Julie Forgioni is a member at the River Garden. Not only do they provide a, a liaison for us to be in touch with for questions, information, um, back and forth, but they do, they've given us supplies such as wood, um, soil, compost, uh, lawn furniture. Laura James is one of the farmers who are really stewards rather than owners of the land. She started to get her hands duty almost 18 years ago. She says she's happy to have the river garden because getting to a green grocer is a bit of a hike. We have to walk to get to the green grocer, you know, we got or take a train, you know, it's not right around here. It's within, a, it's about a mile away to the nearest one. The garden doesn't only slash travel time, it also cuts James's food bill. That's especially important at a time when experts expect food prices to increase by 5% in the first half of 2022. I wouldn't exaggerate if I said that it was hundreds of dollars because, you know, especially with a vegetarian diet, when you eat a lot of that kind of thing, you know, and I've got um, three kids, so we eat a lot of a lot of <laughs> fruits and vegetables. So hundreds of dollars, you know, during the during the um, summer months, the spring and summer months. James and Forgioni say they don't sell their food on a large scale, but Forgioni has made jam with some extra fruit. They are currently looking for new hands to help the garden. Their usual roster of 25 or more members has been depleted in part due to older membership leaving and COVID. They say that despite all the good that city-owned lots like theirs have done, there's always concern that it could be taken away. That's especially the case at a time when developers are looking for new places to build. And ever since Giuliani took away a number of community gardens in the 80s, I, I mean, that not everyone remembers that, but I think that opened the door in a certain way to making the lives of community gardens a little more precarious. So yeah, we need to be functional and flourishing to help to ensure our future. Right off the 2-5 train near the Bronx Zoo's southern entrance is a set of buildings you can't miss, the Phipps Lambert Houses. These low-income duplexes whose color and shape have made them stand out along the block are being torn down and replaced with high-rises. That's prompted some former residents to create a documentary series that looks back on Lambert's hip-hop history. The film also investigates issues concerning the residents as they transition into the new buildings. Shannon Ayala tells us more. This street sign at 180th Street in Boston Road, named after Arthur and Dorothy Cryer, tells a story of music and a community. <laughs> Arthur Cryer sang bass on famous doo-wop tracks like this. Pretty little angel eyes, pretty little angel eyes. But after writing for Motown, Cryer returned to his native borough where he moved into the Lambert houses. He took a job running a block association, organizing youth talent shows and sports programs. That made him one of a web of community figureheads, as Herc Bradley remembers. We have community activists and we have uh, uh, matriarchs, you know, that um, help groom us, you know, from um, Mr. Arthur Cryer, who was a community activist. Bradley says Cryer was a mentor to Lambert youth who became hip hop pioneers, such as DJ Tony Tone, who founded the Cold Crush Brothers and lived on the same floor as Cryer. And other Lambert natives. Like Sha Rock, and we call her the mother of hip hop. She, she was the first female MC. Rock is the woman with the magical touch. I'm like burning fire. You know I'm just too much. And Raheem from Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Raheem, in your life for more can you ask? I bet you can't think of a greater task. Then we have Donald D, 
Magnetizing your mind with rhymes on top of a beat. It's like crime. And then we have the original Spinderella, which is from the group, the female group, Salt and Pepper. Salt and Pepper will move me to the room. It was just an amazing time. It was like the beginning of hip hop. And, you know, we had some of the found founders of hip hop right around us. So, yeah, I, I remember the times going to the park and they plugging in equipment in the street lights and my mama coming to get me from in, down the block, like get in the house. I remember all of that. It was just a really, really incredible time. Brenda Baker, also a Lambert native, has been collaborating with Bradley on a project called Lambert Houses Documentary on YouTube and local BronxNet channel, BronxNet. The series aims to capture Lambert's hip hop contributions and check in with current day residents. Bradley no longer lives at Lambert, but remembers the meaning the place held for him when he and his family moved there, when Lambert opened in 1973 as nonprofit low income housing. Quite a few of us uh we grew up in um tenement walk up tenement buildings old buildings rodents you know uh just run down environments so moving into lambert which is a brand new building is an experience you know it's like it's a fresh new experience Lambert is run by Phipps Houses, the largest nonprofit developer and management company in New York City. The company was founded by philanthropist Henry Phipps in 1905. The online architecture magazine Urban Omnibus says that when the low income development was built in 1973, it was considered, quote, a significant architectural and social contribution with progressive credentials. Now, Phipps is demolishing the 731 jagged complex, replacing it with high rises with twice the number of units. I created the, doc the documentary because they're tearing down Lambert. For me, it's like they're dismantling a part of hip hop, which is Lambert houses. Phipps's vice president, Matthew Washington, says instead of doing piecemeal renovations, Phipps opted to address issues stemming from the design. This development being 50 years old and uh, having, you know, need for repairs and work to be done, you know, we really looked at not just each building, but the entirety of the campus uh, of Lambert Houses uh, to say, what can we do to enhance this? But Bradley and Baker still really care about their community and are investigating complaints. Tenants say they're being downsized to smaller units and that the process to get new apartments can be an ordeal. We're trying to get a, a understanding of how, like what's the requirements to get into the new buildings. Uh, a few seniors were able to be uh, basically accepted into the buildings and a few other people that I know of who was able to get into the building. It took them about a year. But Baker says she's especially concerned hearing from residents who say they don't see as much community programming as there once was. It's very, very important. After school programs, community programs, very, very important in all communities. So yeah, that part, that's why I'm always asking people what, what, what was their experience because um, that's dear to my heart, you know? Washington says there are actually more community programs now, so much so they've outgrown the original community center. They moved into a new space at 178th Street and Boston Road. He says the issue could be residents are unaware of the new space and programs. Shannon Ayala for Diverse City. In the 1970s, West Farms, along with many other areas in the Bronx, was decimated, abandoned, and left to rot. Craig Thompson looks back at the sweat that residents put into rebuilding the area when government officials wouldn't. You have a politician coming here, he won't sleep here, and then he'll turn around and tell you he understands your problem. And then when you do have... These images of the Bronx from a documentary made for the Banana Kelly Community Improvement Association in 1983 are probably familiar to many of us. The other parts, as they become black and Puerto Rican, uh, what you see is the outcome of landlord abandonment and arson. Some areas of the Bronx lost 70% of its housing stock 
and more than half of the population in the 1970s. It looked like Dresden after World War II. The place was like bombed out. Blocks and blocks and blocks, then one building standing. Wanda Solomon lived in a few different apartments in the Bronx at the time. She moved from Puerto Rico in 1975. One of the homes where she lived was at 178th and Daly Avenue in West Farms. We had to move a lot um, throughout my childhood because of the arsonists and fires and what was going on at that time. The Bronx is burning became a catchphrase, but the community, the people who didn't leave, refused to let West Farms and other areas deteriorate. People from the neighborhood would come back and move into those apartments and will do the things that they needed to do. We'll fix the apartment, we'll organize so they could fix the boiler, they were putting their money together to get the oil. They were the one that was fixing the windows and all that other stuff. There were hundreds of buildings where tenants got together, and these are mostly led by women. The tenants got together, started collecting their own rent by themselves, keeping the front door locked, making sure the drugs didn't come in or the social clubs or whatever. Harry DiRienzo was one of the founders of Banana Kelly, an organization to the south of West Farms. Banana Kelly is a community improvement group started in 1978, right as the Bronx was suffering its worst period. They started with youth employment, eventually moving into housing activism. I saw on your brochure, it says Banana Kelly, South Bronx self-help pioneers. Bending their back, picking up the, the burden and the sweat of their brow to renovate, improve, and bring back the vitality that was once here. The confluence of community organizations, churches, and people willing to put in sweat equity saved some of the buildings in West Farms and elsewhere. President Carter even visited one of these organizations in 1977. But he also visited People's Development Corporation. They're a sweat equity crew. And that got a lot of notoriety. And for a hot minute, sweat equity became the president's program. So like Banana Kelly was knocking on doors and doors were shut and we couldn't get anywhere. All of a sudden those doors opened and we were able to get our funding through. Eventually, the city took over some of these abandoned buildings in the Bronx, and some folks were given the opportunity to own them as part of a housing cooperative structure. But West Farms and the South Bronx were rescued, first and foremost, by the residents who chose to stay. A lot of the construction, the re rehab in the Bronx didn't just happen because somebody thought about, oh my God, we just need to do this. It happened because people in the community say we need to do this and let's get organized. For Diverse City, I'm Craig Thompson. Most New Yorkers are familiar with the Flushing Meadows Corona Park 1939 and 1964 World's Fairs. But did you know there was a World Expo in West Farms that predates both of those? Vanessa Monet has the details of this almost forgotten spectacle. The year 1918 brings a few things to mind. It was the early days of the H1N1 influenza pandemic which at the time was the most severe pandemic in recent history. And the globe was also in the midst of the First World War. But few may know that 1918 was also the year of a World Expo set in West Farms. So in 1918, the idea was to have a New York International Exposition for science, arts, and industry. And the idea was to advertise global trade, advertise products, coming from all over the world, produced in America, also to spark uh, real estate in the area. Another idea was to celebrate 300 years of the Bronx founding. Angel Hernandez is a historian and president of the Huntington Free Library in the Bronx. He says the expo came at a bad time. Well, it was one of those wrong times to do it because 1918, we were in the midst of World War I, where a lot of international trade was restricted, especially with Europe. So that's one of the, the reasons why uh, the original idea for this exposition, you know, park never lifted off ground because of what was going on around the world. The International Expo never lived up to that name. Only one other country, Brazil, 
exhibited anything on the fairgrounds along the Bronx River. The park spanned more than 25 acres and was accessible by the East 177th Street subway station. When it opened in May of 1918, only, what, 15 buildings out of the 100 that were proposed were unveiled. So the rest of the projects that were in plan, you know, that was supposed to spark this international uh, trade phenomenon, it just never happened. But to fill in those voids, H.F. McGarvey, who was, you know, the, the head manager of the park at the time, he started buying rides and he started building uh, entertainment venues for people coming. One of the earliest attractions was a massive saltwater swimming pool that could fit almost 9,000 people at once. Another early attraction that got a lot of buzz was the USS Holland, the U.S. Navy's first commissioned submarine. Well, the kids loved it. You can actually walk in, experience. However, it was scrapped by 1932. By 1919, the failing expo reopened a Starlight Park, an amusement park that was a commercial success. By 1921, after H.F. McGarvey died, that's when uh, Starlight Park started bringing in uh, recreational facilities, you know, fitness you know, just adding into that American pastime of baseball, soccer, and all types of sports. This, though, was relatively short-lived. The park actually started declining in the 20s, and it started declining with accidents, lawsuits, fires. By the mid-1930s, the New York Coliseum, which held sports games and events, was the main attraction and what had now become more of a recreational park. At that time, the Bronx was going through an even bigger transition. The Bronx has already changed. There's been a huge demographic shift. Uh, Deindustrialization took a lot of jobs. Uh, There was just a lot going on. Robert Moses already had planned the Cross Bronx Expressway to gut through the Bronx. Then you had migration periods. So it was a different world. It was a different world from 1918 when this idea of an exposition park was conceived. Starlight Park went bankrupt by 1940, and before the decade was over, Robert Moses began building the Cross Bronx Expressway right through the area, permanently altering the terrain of West Farms. Today, a public park named Starlight Park sits just south of the grounds that once held an amusement park full of thrill-seeking New Yorkers for a brief period in history. For Diverse City, I'm Vanessa Monet. That's our look at West Farms in the Bronx. Join us next month when we'll head over to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Till then, thanks for joining us as we explore our diverse city.